Hey there, everybody. Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 367. Today, we're talking about balancing safety and effective training in the martial arts. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and I love the martial arts, which is why we do everything that we do. And you can check out everything we do at whistlekick.com. If you make a purchase, whether that's gear or a uniform or any of the other things that we have over there, lots of cool stuff, new stuff being added all the time, you can save 15% with the code PODCAST15. And don't be afraid to share that. We're just trying to see what the impact of the podcast is on our business. So help us out. Help us see that impact. Of course, if you want the show notes, those are at a separate site. That's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We have transcripts, we have photos, videos, all kinds of great stuff that help you get the most out of each and every episode. Here's something I'd like to ask of you. Here's something really simple you can do that will help us. The next time you're hanging out with your martial arts friends, grab somebody's phone, open their podcast app, and make sure they're subscribed to Martial Arts Radio. Maybe you've got somebody who has never listened to a podcast before. Expose them. Teach them. Share this show and the other shows that you love with them, whether they're martial arts shows or not. I've received tons of emails over the last few years from folks who came into podcasts because of this show, and now they've discovered the whole world that is podcasts, and they really enjoy it. So don't be afraid to share. All right, let's dig in now. Let's talk about the balance between safety in trading with effectiveness. Because, of course, there are two sides, in a sense, of a spectrum. We can have all kinds of safe training that isn't effective. And we could have what some would define as very effective training, that but has no safety whatsoever. And I would suggest that the two are opposite ends of a spectrum, and finding a balance is critical to your training, to your students' training, to everyone's training. Now, of course, there are dangerous things that you can do in training that have very little to even no benefit. They're not helpful. And those things are foolish. And for this episode, we're not going to talk about them. Because if you have something that is neither safe nor effective, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Maybe it's fun. And if it's fun, you could argue that it's effective. But I'm not going to go down that path because it's a really short path, right? Don't do dumb things. <laughs> but let's talk about calculated risk. Everything that we do in our training has risk. Just by getting out of bed in the morning, you incur risk. So when we step out, when we're training, when we're doing our martial arts, there is risk involved. How many people have tweaked a knee and gone down just because they turn strangely? doing a stance or a turn or a form that they've done hundreds or thousands of times before. It happens. But that doesn't mean that we stop doing those things. We have to calculate the risk. And for each of those exercises or, or movements or whatever it is we're doing, we're trying to mitigate the risk. Now, when we look at stances, for example, there are certain things that you do or should be doing in the way that your foot is positioned and your, your hips and your knees so that you're not putting undue stress on joints. That's mitigating risk. Sure, you could do it the other way, but long-term, it's going to hurt you. So we don't do that. We calculate the risk as being greater in doing that, and then we mitigate the risk. We reduce it as much as we can. And what's the other component to risk? What do we look at when we look at risk? We look at reward. We've all heard the phrase risk versus reward, and that's really what we're doing with our training every single time, even if we're not thinking about it in that way. But to the purpose of today's episode, we're going to think about it in exactly that way. Now, of course, risk versus reward is a moving target. Depending on your, your age, your rank, or, or skill, if we're not thinking about rank, your goals from your training, these all change where on that effectiveness versus safety spectrum your training should be. And it shouldn't always be the same. Different people are going to respond to different kinds of training. And depending on where you are in your day, in your life, you may need different kinds of training. You've got to mix it up. And 
whether or not you realize it, you already do this. I'm not talking about anything today that doesn't already happen in every single martial arts school I've ever been part of. All I'm trying to get people to do with this episode today is to think about it. And by thinking about it and communicating about it, it can become more effective. It can become more supportive of everyone's martial arts journey. Of course, everyone's comfort, their tolerance for risk is different. And a good instructor is going to guide people from wherever their comfort is towards whatever the goals are. Some people, you tell them, hey, you know what? I need you to step into this circle where you're going to deal with a number of simulated attackers. Just stepping in that circle is incredibly intimidating for some people. Other people will step in and say, yeah, bring it. And yeah, with time training and with skill and rank and age, that gets easier for people. But I've seen black belts who struggle in that environment. But I've also seen young, low-ranked children thrive in it. So while there is some correlation to rank, age, skill, it's not always a direct correlation. And understanding where people are at is critical. Because the goal of every drill is different. Every drill should have a goal, right? If you don't have something you're trying to get out of whatever that training is, probably shouldn't be doing it. But if the gap between what is necessary to achieve the goal and where people are at is too great, they're not going to get anything out of it. And in fact, you put them at risk for injury, for at the very least, not getting the result and them feeling poorly about their training, maybe even themselves, maybe even your quality of instruction, and maybe they leave. And that's not the goal. If they're not their training, you can't help them. So we want to make sure that we are giving appropriate drills to people, not just based on rank. Because one of the things that we don't often talk about with martial artists is that We're all people. We come in with our own experiences. Some of the people, just point blank, have been assaulted, have been attacked, have been harmed, or maybe they grew up in abusive homes and certain drills are going to have, you know, almost a a PTSD effect on them. We have to be aware of that and not just simply push people in and say, get over it which unfortunately is something I've seen at quite a few schools. As an instructor, if that seems like it's going on, be aware that some people are going to need an out and maybe you have a conversation with them. Now let's talk about the ways that we mitigate the risk. We improve the ratio of reward to risk in our drills, in our training. The first off, proper communication. As an instructor, you should be communicating to the students or the people running the drills, everyone involved. They should understand what the parameters of the drill are, what the goals of the drill are, and what are the things to watch for. Make sure everyone understands. Maybe you have to say it in multiple ways. Maybe you have to demonstrate it. You should always make sure things are communicated verbally and visually. And ideally, if, it, if the drill supports that, tactically, take people through what you're asking them to do. The more of these components that you do, the more it's going to register, it's going to click for people, and the more they're going to get out of it while reducing the risk of injury or, or some kind of negative impact. The next one, safety equipment. Now, of course, at Whistle Cake, we sell safety equipment. So oftentimes people think that I blindly support people wearing safety equipment 100% of the time. Absolutely not. There are times when safety equipment is appropriate. There are times when safety equipment is not. It depends on the drill. It depends on the people participating in the drill. And it depends on the goal. Safety equipment can give a false sense of confidence. But it can also give an appropriate level of confidence. And it depends on not only the factors I just gave you, but the individuals participating. There are drills that I will run with and without gear, depending on who's participating. The next one, the one that I wish happened far more, identifying the students that are going to be a problem. 
We all know those people who go too hard. We all know those people who don't pay good enough attention that they're a risk. Identifying who those people are and taking appropriate action, whether that's excluding them from the drill or making sure they don't go first or having a conversation with them, all appropriate depending on the situation. Unfortunately, sometimes instructors do not want to make waves. They don't want to upset people. So they just let this stuff happen. And that really bothers me. Because the role of an instructor, whether that's school owner or whoever's running the drill, is to make sure first and foremost that people are safe. Now that's an appropriate level of safety. Yes, it's martial arts. Things are going to happen. But when you look at a drill and you say, you know what, that guy always goes too hard and there's somebody over there who doesn't pay attention and they're matched up, ooh, that's not a good thing to let happen. So don't let it happen. Which leads to the next piece. Proper pairings and groupings for drills. Oftentimes, we'll just say it's by rank or by age or by size. And it's so much more than that. It's all of those things, but it's also... What's going on with people that day? Energy level. Attentiveness. Are they dealing with things at home? All of these factors tie together so that when you pair and group people up, or they pair and group themselves up, it should be a grouping that gets the most benefit to the most people with the least risk. There have been times where it makes the most sense that I, as a senior rank, pair up with someone very young or very low ranked. There are also times where it makes more sense that I'm paired up with people more considered my, my peers in terms of rank or age or, or size or, or whatever. Understanding the goals of the drill for that day should get you to where that needs to be. And it's never going to be a perfect fit because you're never going to have thousands of people in class that give you such a broad sample of the type of people that are training. Quite often, you look around and go, man, here's this one outlier, you know, the the guy who's 6'10", 280, and everyone else in class is 5'9". I've seen that happen. Or the 12-year-old who, you know, doesn't belong in in the, the kids' class anymore, so steps into the adult class, but is far smaller and far less confident than everyone else. You got to make it work. And sometimes we fall back on communication and sometimes safety equipment. Maybe the 12 year old's wearing safety equipment and everyone else isn't. Maybe that's what's needed. Understanding the differences between people is just so crucial because our job as instructors is to set everyone up for success. Maintaining a proper an appropriate atmosphere. The more risk the drill has, the more tempered you should make the atmosphere. Say it another way. The higher the intensity, the higher the stress, the adrenaline that's coming through in a drill, the calmer everyone else should be when they're not participating. So it doesn't escalate. On the other side, the less risk, the more you want to bring people up. You want to elevate the energy in the room so that they can get as much out of it as possible. You, as an instructor, even if you're not participating, have a tremendous amount of control over the energy there and can almost puppeteer people into getting the most out of the drill. So do it. Don't be afraid of that control, that power that you have just being on the side. Now, here's an element that comes up in most of our conversations, ego, reducing ego. Every school has people who define their place in life by their impact, sometimes figuratively, figuratively, sometimes literally, in their training. Working to reduce the impact of that ego Maybe having a private conversation with people before the drill, you know, just pull somebody aside and say, 
hey, look at who you're working with there. You don't need to crack them in the skull. Bring it down. And making sure you follow up. Making sure that that ego isn't coming through in an unsafe manner. You're not going to get rid of people's ego by talking to them. But you can cut the cord between their ego and their actions if you stay on top of it. I mentioned the next piece at the beginning with communication, but setting goals. Understanding the goals of the drill and making sure everyone else understands the goals as well. And sometimes that includes telling them what the goals are not. And as I said, we do this. The purpose of this drill is to get you faster, but it's not about teaching you to hit harder. Or the goal of this drill is to get you to combine movements, to build combinations, but I don't care how fast you do it. Things like that. Helping people understand what their parameters are gives them the freedom to explore and to become better martial artists. And of course, observing. As an instructor, you should be incredibly attentive to what is going on with all of the drills. And sometimes there's a tendency to want to jump in, to show people how things are done. And that can work. But when you have multiple groupings, you have to be careful of that. That doesn't mean that you can't designate someone else. Say, hey, I'm going to jump in on this group here. Can you just walk around and observe? And you know what? Yeah, someone with more training, someone who's older, especially a parent, is likely to be better at observing and stopping problems before they occur. But it doesn't have to be. Sometimes, just by knowing that there are people watching, students will act better. And finally, erring on the side of caution. You're never going to set up a drill perfectly. There are too many factors. So when you look at what makes the most sense for these parameters, these guidelines that you're going to give students, understanding that walking it back just a hair sometimes a lot, but usually just a little bit, makes more sense than letting them cross the line. You're never going to find the perfect line for all of these conditions. So admit that. Understand that. And know that most of the time, students are going to push over the line instead of stay too far back from it. And there you have it. These are my thoughts on reducing risk, on mitigating risk, on giving students the most you can from any drill. Now, a lot of times you're going to think of this stuff with regard to partner drills or group drills, especially around self-defense or sparring technique. It doesn't have to be that. There is risk versus reward with forms and basics. And the risk doesn't have to be injury. Sometimes the risk is wasting time, not giving people as much as you could. If you're trying to get people better at their stances, I'm sure you have a bunch of different drills that you could do. And if you choose the one that is less effective, well, isn't that a disservice to the students? So understanding how these apply to everything that you're doing with your training makes sense. Now, if you're not an instructor, if you're a student, hopefully you're training on your own and you can use some of these guidelines for your own training. Think backwards from the goals. Don't just blindly do the drills and the movements that you're taught in class. Come up with your own. Understand what you're doing, why you're doing it. And if you don't know, ask your instructor. This has been episode 367 of Martial Arts Radio. If you want to find the transcripts, that's at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find our products, some on Amazon, but everything's at whistlekick.com, and you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on our hats and shirts and sweatpants and what else we got over there? Shoes. So much stuff. You can follow us on social media. We are at Whistlekick on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and I love to hear from you. The best place to leave feedback for this or any other episode is at the website. 
under the comments section. We appreciate those comments. And sometimes those comments lead to other episodes or great conversation. I appreciate you. Thank you for your time today. And thank you for your support of everything we do. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. What? <laughs>